I think the, the future of audio is one that's customized, personalized, interactive, intelligent, and dynamic. You know, instead of always treating audio as on and off, we need to treat it in a way that's delivered to each person as a unique experience. Welcome to Audio Branding, the hidden gem of marketing. Sound plays a more important role in human behavior and our decision-making than you may realize. In this podcast, I'll help you understand the art and science of sound so you can better influence others in business and your life. I'm your host, Jody Krangle. Let's delve a little deeper. This is the first part of my interview with John Brennan and Sean Beeson from Sonic Signatures. For today's interview, we have a two-for-one. That doesn't happen a lot here, but these two make up a powerful sonic duo, so I didn't want to split up the band. My first guest is John Brennan, a music composer and sound designer with 20 years of experience creating sound for iconic brands and multimedia platforms. With the rise of voice, podcasts, and streaming, he's founded Sonic Signatures to enable brands to effectively use branded audio across all campaigns and platforms. He's created audio logos, original music, and sound design for leading brands, including Amazon Alexa, Tide, Southwest Airlines, IBM Security, Mercy Health, Union Home Mortgage, and Keep Truckin'. His film scores include internationally distributed feature films and documentaries, and he has an MFA in music composition for the screen from Columbia College, Chicago. My second guest is Sean Beeson, a composer and sound designer who has worked on hundreds of scores for games, ads, trailers, and podcasts for clients like Google, Disney, McDonald's, Taco Bell, State Farm, Wizards of the Coast, and those of you that know me know I really approve of that one, Neoglyphic, and Sony. While at Google, he helped develop the sonic identity of Google's Pixel Phone, Pixel Buds 2, Google Home, and Mac Speaker. He's contributed to three Emmy Award-winning projects and has been nominated for multiple Game Award Network Guild Awards. If you want to understand why audio is so important to your brand, John and Sean have a thing or two to tell you about that. And, you know, I created this whole podcast for that. As always, if you have questions for my guests, you're welcome to reach out through the links in the show notes. And if you have questions for me, visit audiobrandingpodcast.com, where you'll find a lot of ways to get in touch. Plus, subscribing to the newsletter will let you know when the new podcasts are available. And now, without further ado, here's my interview with the power duo of John Brennan and Sean Beeson from Sonic Signatures. Welcome to the Audio Branding Podcast, guys. I really appreciate your coming on the show. Thank you for having us. (laughs) I've been looking forward to this because I know that you guys do a lot of audio branding and we've had some uh, pretty extensive conversations about it. (laughs) So I'd like to do that recording it now. (laughs) Excellent. Um, But I did want to start off asking each of you if you had an early memory of sound and how it moved you. Just to sort of set the scene of how you got into this whole audio industry. Sure. Well, uh, so I grew up in the countryside in rural Ohio, and I was lucky enough to have um, four siblings, and two of which were, uh, well, three of which which were older. And um, my older brother would always call me down to his basement in his room and uh, show me, you know, the newest pop songs, you know. And I'll never forget uh, the first time I heard Depeche Mode and the song Enjoy the Silence. And I, I think I was probably around fifth grade, and I had just never heard anything like it. And so I remember um, just waiting for that song to come on, and as soon as it came on, hitting record on the boombox and running upstairs to the fireplace mantle because I had figured out in the house that if you put the boombox on top of the fireplace, that that was the best reception. And I finally wow. got that song recorded. <laughs> Resourceful. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I just remember listening to that song over and over again. <laughs> That's great. Did yeah. it inspire you in a particular way? Like, was it the emotions it made you feel? Or was it just the way the song was made? Or Yeah. You know, I think it was just that electronic instrumentation. And it was just so different Uh you know, at the time for anything that I had heard. 
And, you know, it totally influenced my life because then, you know, I became a teenager and I chose to to learn how to play piano and, and play keyboards and sure. and have a rock band. But, you know, playing keyboard songs and uh, so, that, yeah, Depeche Mode influence has always been there. OK, I have to ask you, what was the rock band called? Oh, my band in high yeah. school? Yeah. <laughs> uh, believe it or not, it was Sexual Chocolate. <laughs> <laughs> See, uh, those are always uh, the best ones. The ones in high yeah. school. <laughs> yeah. We had an African-American lead singer, and uh, he liked to perform with his shirt off on stage. Oh, and, okay. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, I think he was, Jimi Hendrix was kind of his idol, I think, in some ways. Um, okay. But, uh, yeah, so sexual chocolate. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. That's great. <laughs> what about you, Sean? Do you have any early memories of sound? Yes. Yeah. Mine aren't quite uh, as exciting as that. I think we need a reunion tour. <laughs> yeah. That band. Sexual chocolate. That's that's <laughs> yeah, that's pretty back. exciting. <laughs> yeah. So some of my earliest memories, even from my childhood, are actually they actually involve playing video games. Um, and so I, I jokingly say that I was born with a Sega Genesis controller in my hand. <laughs> I and love you that. would uh, you would put in a game like Sonic the Hedgehog, and you're greeted with this gigantic white background and a very bright, vibrant blue logo that says Sega. And of course, you get the singers to go Sega. And I just remember hearing that the first time and being like, "Wait a second, that's seems really high fidelity, you know, to have something like that in the game." And what was always so fun about that is you would uh, put in a different game. And I'm thinking of like Jurassic Park off the top of my head. And it shows the mm -hmm. Sega logo. And the T-Rex pops up and goes, Sega. And, <laughs> and so they have this trend of, of having the logo, which was, you know, uniquely different for a lot of games, had kind of their own branded spin on it. And so that always has stuck out to me is is something that I remember from a very young age of kind of getting me really interested not only in in audio but also in in the game industry um and you know they're still using that that branding to this day because of how effective it was. Oh yeah, super effective. Yeah, I can imagine that that would be a huge influence. They also say that when it comes to audio branding, sonic branding, that if you use the name of the company in the sound, that it's much more effective because you remember it a lot better. <laughs> so That's Sega right. really had something going there. <laughs> mm -hmm. That's pretty awesome. Yeah. So where did you get started, Sean? Was it the video game experience you had or was there something else that inspired you to get into that? I absolutely come from the background of the game industry, um, not only working in uh, very serious kinds of games, but also doing a lot of work in casual gaming, where sound is such a vibrant part of that experience, um, as well as working in, in the casino industry. So working on slot machines, oh, where yeah. okay. if you're working on a themed slot, every sound every bit of music has to really accentuate the theme of the slot sometimes uh, annoyingly so you know like you <laughs> yes, have to hit the, yeah you're competing with so much other sound mm -hmm. um in that environment but those sounds really have to accentuate the mood and the theme of the slot and so i've been doing um you know gaming based audio for for half of my life and I think that it felt like a natural transition to get into sonic branding to really boil down the essence of a of a project or a product or a brand to what really makes it unique and what really helps it relate to the consumer or the user of that product. Yeah, I love that. That makes a lot of sense, too. Yeah. Um, and, and I totally agree about the slot machines. Yes, it can totally become um, very annoying. But <laughs> at the same time, you don't forget it very easily, <laughs> which no. I guess is the point of a lot of advertising. You want to be memorable. <laughs> and there's a lot of techniques and, and tools that you use, especially in, in gaming, that kind of translate perfectly to do doing sonic branding, some of which I'm sure will we'll talk about, but one that's very common is the shape of a sound, the shape of a melody. 
Um, just like in a slot machine, if you need something to sound celebratory and exciting, you will tend to use notes in a specific orientation that really makes it feel uplifting and energized versus if you uh, fail at getting a free spin or you lose a bonus, then all of a sudden you will reverse the direction of those notes. Um, and the same thing applies to sonic branding. If you want to achieve a certain effect, there's things that you can do uh, musically to kind of uh, to aid that process. Sure. I, uh, kind of a, like a, a strange question for you that sort of goes off of that. And I know that in advertising, they don't like doing this either, but bad sounds like do they want people to to hear you know sounds of disappointment or are they really gearing towards the happy sounds it, because it, it it seems like in a lot of advertising they never want people to be angry they never want people to be upset right so i guess how does that carry through with the gaming situation it's sometimes in in certain kinds of gaming you really want the the player to feel despair or discouraged if it's part of the narrative when it comes to uh some casual gaming and gaming where you really want the player to be constantly engaged or uh, in the case of maybe slot machines you want them to be a little addicted they will always say even if the sound is negative it still has to be positive even if you're losing you need to be winning it always needs to sound as if you're winning, even if you're losing a lot of money, because it's important to have the player not feel put off, to not feel discouraged. And I think branded audio and UI audio and UX audio are the same way. Even if you need to coach someone about a negative behavior or alert them to something, it still needs to fit in the ecosystem of that brand. You know, it can't be so far out that um, it feels disconnected from the experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that's a, a very good point. So, John, what about you? How did you get in, into the whole audio branding, sonic branding space? Yeah, I guess I'll, I remember that moment. Um, <laughs> my wife and I were actually um, at a log cabin in the woods, and we... I guess we're just talking about the future of media. I think was actually reading an article in a magazine. You know, it was just this convergence of media at the time with podcasting being new and uh, the Amazon Alexa device was new and just this convergence of, of technologies. And I just remember thinking, man, this is, this is the future of audio. You know, this is where I want to be. Um, you know, I want to be on the forefront of, of what's happening and shaping where things are going. And, uh, you know, I think it was really at that moment that, you know, came home and started thinking about rebranding and created the Sonic Signatures brand, really. Yeah. And that was probably, yeah, 2017, I guess, is when, um, when that I mean, happened. I know that we're all dealing with a lot these days, so I really wanted to acknowledge those that have gone out of their way to leave an honest review of this podcast. Like Gregory, who writes, More. There is more to branding and marketing. Thanks to Audio Branding for introducing me to the world of audio and sound. Love it. Thanks, Gregory. I appreciate the listen and the kind words. And for those of you that are interested, you can also leave a voice review now off of the main podcast page. It's super simple and fun, and I'd love to hear what you think. Now, back to the show. So how did you and Sean meet? Did you already know each other when you started the company, or how did that happen? We did. So I guess it was around that time Sean and I had met at uh, a gaming conference called GDEX in Columbus, Ohio. Gaming, and, of course. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And uh, I had a video game there that I had written music for. And uh, so I was there kind of with that game. And I had looked up Sean. Well, actually, Sean had reached out earlier on Twitter just being in it's such a small world as composers living in um, Ohio. And so I had kind of sought out Sean at the conference and, um, you know, it's kind of a small world at those conferences being in audio. So we all kind of gravitated to each other and had lunch together and that kind of started the relationship. Yeah. It's amazing how small the world is. <laughs> mm -hmm. It can certainly make it easier to uh, meet people that you would want to work with on a regular basis. So I'm glad you guys found each other because clearly you're making something great with the company. <laughs> yeah, thank you. So um, 
What makes your company different from other audio branding companies then? I mean, you started it in 2017, right? Mm -hmm. So when you did that, what did you have in mind that would differentiate you? Did you know that there were other companies out there doing that? Yeah. Yeah. So I, I started doing some research and, um, you know, looking at uh, the market need and, you know, what we could fulfill um, from that standpoint, who we could really help and be of service to. And I really thought that I wanted to have an audio branding company that had an expertise across original music, sound design, and voice. So that we'd really have, you know, all three of those expertises covered uh, within our within our business. And so that's really where I sought out uh, partnerships from there. And so Sean has an incredible background um, in UX audio design. I know he uh, talked recently just about um, slot machines, but he actually worked at Google as a full-time sound designer, creating sounds for um, many Google devices, including the Pixel line of phones, earbuds, and Google Home speaker. And so, you know, that is something that Sean brought to the table that that myself do not have experience in. So I have a background in commercial music and producing sounds for advertising, where Sean has a whole interactive uh, background. And so the two of us are able to partner and and cover, you know, both sides of, um, you know, music, interactive audio together. That's a really good point, actually, because I know that sonic branding sounds different on, let's say, a television screen or a computer streaming than it does on Google Home. Mm. <laughs> so that difference is being able to have it effective in both mediums is is a very good selling point, I would imagine. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. And, you know, I think what, what makes us different is that, you know, our goal in our business, what is to stay small? You know, we really are the experts in our fields and we feel that, you know, we are able to best you know, help a company uh, through our one-on-one -on -one relationship. And it's through that personalization that we can come up with the most custom and creative results that are the most effective in the long run, because we are not uh, creating a brief and giving it to outside composers who are not part of the process. You know, we are working hand in hand with the company to learn, you know, what are the problems that company is facing? What are its opportunities? Where do they want to be? You know, what do they want to move into? And how does sound reinforce that identity? You know, how can we create a custom uh, sonic package that is going to embrace, you know, where that where that company needs to be? And And that is something that you know, we do as, as, as experts in the field. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, speaking of experts in the field, uh, do you guys have a specific definition of audio branding that you're working from when you're creating something for these companies? What is it you're creating? How do you define that? Yeah. You know, I don't think we have a specific definition, but one I came up with for your show, because I knew you were going to ask me, is just to boil it down <laughs> to, you know, the the shortest essence of what sonic branding is, because obviously, it, it, you know, it can be an umbrella term. It's just that it is the strategic and consistent use of audio to support a brand identity. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. So it's a it's a very overarching kind of thing. It, it isn't just the music. It isn't just the branded, branded sounds. It isn't just the voice. It's a whole bunch of these things plus more depending on where you're using it. Like we were just discussing using it on, say, a television or a radio or on Google Home. <laughs> mm -hmm. I think it has to even go beyond that now. You have to approach audio as well from the experience of the user and how the user interacts with it. Mm -hmm. You know, so sonic branding extends beyond just having a jingle or a piece of music. Um, and it really needs to kind of aid the user to be able to, to identify, interact and interpret the audio so that it creates a better experience uh, when you're talking about UX and UI audio. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, I see what you mean. So what about dynamic audio, Sean? How does that work? Right, so I think that's another strength uh, to the Sonic Signatures brand is that we both have experience in dynamic and interactive audio. And especially with the way that technology is, is moving, everything is becoming 
interactive. Everything is becoming dynamic. We are placing uh, more resources into artificial intelligence and machine learning. Mm -hmm. And so the more that the technology learns about how we use it, the more things become dynamic and interactive. In audio, in traditional advertising mediums, is very linear. It's very static. But the game industry has always had dynamic audio. It's kind of the cornerstone of how people interact, identify, interpret uh, the audio. It's what enhances the brand. And so I think the you know the future of audio in branding and in UX and UI audio is something that is more dynamic, something that is specifically catered to the user or to the environment. Um, and I would even say that possibly the future of, of branding is one that is without visual stimulus always. Um, people can be a, a bit more apprehensive to have things watching them yeah. And to always have a screen in front of their face. But we are pretty accustomed to interacting with uh, uh, voice assistants that are always that are always listening, whether we know it or not. And so I think with audio always listening, in order to deliver the best audio experience back to the user or to the customer, it needs to be dynamic. It needs to react and interact with the user, again, in the environment uh, that they're in. And so I think a, a great example of that that's just a very simple example uh, is I always come back to Netflix, that it's, it's audio branding. It's great. It's super loud. It's always very loud. And you never know yes. how loud, you never know how loud it's going to be. You know, is my volume's at 20. Is that quiet enough? It's at 50. Is that too loud? A great example of this is the other night, we, we turn on Netflix at 10 o'clock at night in that audio branding of when it pops up is so loud in the simplest form of of adaptive audio or dynamic or intelligent audio it would maybe sense that it's 10 p.m and that our our viewing habits are that we really <laughs> don't watch that much at night so maybe yeah. that's that audio branding would be 50 percent quieter in the simplest form i think that audio needs to take that contextual consideration moving forward and I think the more that audio does that and embraces interactivity and di dynamicism, the more it can break away from needing visual branding uh, to cooperate with. That's right. Sure. I agree. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead, John. Well, I was saying, uh, Sean doesn't even know this. I wrote a quote uh, this morning uh, that he's involved in um, for music for a museum. And as part of the RFP for the museum, they talked about this is um, the lights dimming and coming back on with each of these video experiences to kind of help the audience understand, okay, now it's time to move on. You can go uh, into the next part of the museum. And there's, you know, discrete videos that play. And so I was talking, you know, in our proposal saying, well, we can do, we can also do that with the music. Whereas when there's a large audience and they need to move the the people through the museum more quickly, the the, um, the music tempo can be fuller and faster, and that's going to move people along. And then the converse is true uh, when there is less people. We you use the stems of the music that are quieter, more atmospheric, and a slower tempo to let people meander and and take their time. I love that. Yeah. So, so very dynamic, depending mm -hmm. on the audience. Yeah, exactly. I like that a lot. So that's a great use case. <laughs> uh, I, I don't know uh, what will happen with that proposal, but I hope you get it. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs> yeah. Are you looking for ways to improve your company's or podcast's impact? You'd be surprised how powerful the use of an intentional audio branding strategy can be. Want to know more? I have a free downloadable PDF that gives you my five tips for implementing an intentional audio strategy at voiceoversandvocals.com slash audio dash branding dash strategy. That location does ask to put you on a mailing list just to send you updates on when the new podcasts come out. But if you really don't want to give your email out, I understand. Just contact me directly. My email is all over my website and I'll make sure you get that PDF without needing to sign up anywhere. 
If you do sign up though, you also get access to a resources section called The Studio, where I have videos, white papers and PDFs, discounts from my guests, and snippets of audio from my guests that no one else gets to hear. So maybe it's worth your while. Totally up to you. And of course, if you're looking for voiceovers, you can get in touch with me about that too. Now, back to the podcast. Very exciting. And it's interesting to see it used both in the sounds and in the music. So adapted to the environment that it's going to be used in. I like that a lot. Mm -hmm. Right. And I think the, the future of audio is one that's customized, personalized, interactive, intelligent, and dynamic. You know, instead of always treating audio as on and off, we need to treat it in a way that's delivered to each person as a unique experience. And I think that that's something we're always thinking about, whether it's for a full you know, audio branding brief, or if it's for a handful of uh, UI sounds, we're trying to think not only now, but how it's going to work in the future for the brand. Yeah. And, you know, part of what people say is, you know, creating a flexible system. So, you know, recently we had just a one-off uh, gig for a client, which I think we might play later uh, for an audio logo, but that audio logo has multiple different versions that can play in different scenarios and different use cases. So what are those different scenarios, just out of curiosity? Uh, for one, it would be, um, so like broadcast, uh, and then whether it's, um, so live event would be their second one. And th these were different use cases that we came up with looking at uh, their primary, uh, you know, touch points with their audience. And then the third one was future use on their mobile app because they're a very technology forward company and they have an app, but um, they didn't have any sounds associated with it. So we created versions of that audio logo that could signify their technology signing in or turning on. And the same thing when you're exiting that technology as well. I was going to ask you, sort of as a spinoff from this, what your best practices are for putting together not only a proposal, but the actual thing, <laughs> the actual audio brand for your clients. How do you go about doing that? It sounds like a, a really big process. <laughs> yeah, well, we we love processes. I mean, I just personally, I'm a very detail-oriented person, and um, I'm the kind of person who opens the product and reads the instructions <laughs> fully before I start. Oh my goodness, uh, you are rare. <laughs> 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 um, so yeah, we do have, um, actual written best practices that we're going through for audio logos and things like that, that we, um, walk our, our clients through. And that kind of helps, um, get everyone on the same page because when you educate your client to start with, and you're saying, Hey, this is what's working in the field. These are the best practices. And Hey, this has been backed up by testing. Um, you know, it gets really everyone on the same page and thinking the same way. And it's less about what you personally like and dislike as opposed to, um, you know, what has shown to work the most in testing. So that's that's kind of what we try to default back to is our, our processes. Mm -hmm. um, but we break our audio branding process, you know, basically just into two um, different steps. And so like step one is discovery and strategy. And then step two would be producing the audio assets and step and then the second part of that would be testing. Yeah, I would imagine the testing is a pretty big part. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And then going back and revising, you know, depending on yeah. how it performed. How long does this usually take? I mean, from the creation of the proposal to the accepting of the proposal to the actual delivery of all the audio assets? Well, it definitely varies, varies by project. Oh, sure. Um, yeah. Yeah, we had an audio logo. Like what's, the, that... what's the shortest you've done and what's the longest you've done? <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, one month uh, we did an audio logo that had, to, you know, had broadcast dates already booked. And they actually even moved it up a week without telling us until we were already uh, in the, you know. Because that happens. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, but it was, you know, we actually delivered it, you know, totally it, almost a week early anyway, um, just because it was very you know, we got everyone aligned with what we were going to do and then we did it and it was, it was great. Um, so that, that was, that was a, a great opportunity that turned out well. And that, that was about three to four weeks. Um, and then, yeah, we've had, we've had other projects, you know, go on for three months and those projects are, you know, had to do with hardware devices where your, your periods of waiting because you're putting that audio into the hardware and then getting it out in the field to be tested and implemented. And then, you know, and, and revising 
uh, things depending on how it's performing within the device itself. I would imagine that's where Sean's expertise really shines. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, and sometimes you're really uh, you engine the engineers having to have the the audio implemented into the device can also be a part of that process that can take time because as much as we we preach about the significance of audio, sometimes it is unfortunately an afterthought. Um, Oh, just, more often than of, not, from my experience. <laughs> they may yeah. not have a whole lot of engineering resources dedicated specifically to the implementation or integration of audio mm -hmm. in, into into hardware or even software versus, you know, somebody dropping a piece of, of sonic branding into an advertisement is something we can do. But in order to actually get audio into a physical device is something that uh, is beyond our capabilities. Uh, so you're really kind of at the mercy of that engineering and hardware team. And sometimes they make changes to the hardware and you don't know about that until after you've delivered the sounds and then you subsequently have to go back. Uh, you know, so there's lots of things like that that, sh that you can't forecast in, in budgeting for time for projects. So you just never know. Sure. Yeah. That's it's quite the process. <laughs> and I, I imagine you have to go back and forth a lot. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, creating a calendar helps. Oh, calendars. Yes. Again, it comes down to the process. So one of the first things we do is, um, you know, after we get approved on that budget is we'll create a, a, a you know project calendar and that's going to have, you know, that discovery and strategy. It's going to have, you know, your initial delivery dates and it's going to have your revisions delay you know dates in there testing dates and you really if you can get everyone aligned on a calendar with the dates they're going to hear it the dates they're going to get back to you with revisions it just makes everything go so much smoother mm, I imagine and that's something i think that that john in particular has excelled at really is kind of getting people involved in that process and also having everybody be accountable to those deadlines because it's so easy to let that stuff slip, uh, especially in, in the hardware and software world because, again, you know, they find a bug and then everything's pushed back. And then here we are, you know, not sure what's going on. And I think that uh, that's been a, a great part of our process is that, that John is always checking in and we're always meeting as a team with their teams uh, and kind of encouraging the people that we work with to be involved in the process and not just us handing over audio at the last minute and saying, here you go, our, you know, our, our job is done, it's your turn. Yeah. Um, everybody is integrated into the process from the creative planning parts to the actual creation to the implementation. We, we like to see everything through uh, from the beginning to the end and having that calendar really is important. Mm, yeah, I can imagine it would be. This has been part one of our interview. I hope you'll tune in next week for part two. Well, that's the end of this episode. Thanks for listening. And if you like what you heard, why not tell a friend about this podcast? It's available in all the usual locations. Until next time. Bye.